Welcome everyone. I'm Janez Castonguay, VP at Clarius. We've hosted many veterinary webinars demonstrating how to use POCUS for a variety of diagnostic exams so that you can confidently identify pathology in the lungs, heart, abdomen, and so on. Today, our team is excited to host a webinar on how to use wireless ultrasound for safer, more accurate procedures. Welcome to our live session, Practical Small Animal Ultrasound, Guiding Safe, Accurate Fine Needle Aspirations. In a moment, we'll welcome back veterinary ultrasonographer and educator, Dr. Camilla Edwards. She'll demonstrate how to perform more accurate and effective fine needle aspirations of abdominal organs under ultrasound guidance to ensure patient safety. We'll learn best practices for reducing repeat sampling, increasing diagnostic yield, and avoiding clinical complications while providing the answers to make the right treatment decisions. Following her presentation, we'll see live scanning with Claris Clinical Manager, Shelley Gunther, who will help us hone our ultrasound imaging techniques. You can use the Q&A feature at any time during today's webinar. We'll address questions in a live Q&A session following the presentation and live scanning. Today's session is race approved, thanks to the Vet Show. So please do stay on for the full webinar to qualify for one CECPD credit, which you'll be able to redeem from an email from the Vet Show in the coming weeks. I'd like to thank all 3,100 doctors of veterinary medicine who registered for today's popular event. Let me now introduce you to your host, Dr. Oran Frankel. Dr. Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. A passionate POCUS educator, Dr. Frankel has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. He practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician and serves as chairman of our medical advisory board. Hi, Dr. Frankel, and welcome back. Hi, Janice. Thanks. It's good to be back on this interesting topic. Uh, to set the stage for today's discussion, we did a bit of a literature review into a topic that admittedly I knew very little about going into this webinar on fine needle aspiration, specifically in the veterinary practice world. And what we started to find, if I can review some of the papers, one was uh, this review that I really liked that highlighted the current state of affairs in obtaining fine needle aspiration. And it showed that it really can be done at cage side and that often it can result in definitive diagnosis. And then if by facilitating downstream treatment and expediting treatment plans by ruling in or ruling out specific diseases. And what's great about this procedure performed with point of care ultrasound is that there's rarely a need for general anesthesia uh, because it can avoid needing a more complicated surgery and surgical biopsy. And the small needle that gets used for fine needle aspiration can prevent a lot of clinical, clinical complications that can be seen with more invasive procedures. And while there's some controversy around whether to aspirate or not aspirate, both in veterinary and in the human world, there's concordance on the utility of the procedure either way to do a fine needle uh, assessment and biopsy to obtain cytological samples. And finally, in this review specific to GI lesions, in the majority of cases where they did a full cohort of cases for fine needle aspiration produced clinically useful results in a fraction of the time that it's required to obtain surgical biopsies. So it really seems to be a profound impact on clinical workflows and clinical care in the veterinary practice. Before we jump in to go a little deeper into the how-tos, we wanted to put up this poll for you on what do you see as the benefits of in-house ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration? Please answer any that might strike you as being relevant. Do you think it will provide or can provide more rapid diagnosis that using the ultrasound prevents complications, can help expedite your treatment plans uh, and management of patients, avoids the need to refer clients and patients out to other practices to perform uh, invasive procedures and helps you uh, proceed to the next level of care or are you unsure, unsure about the benefits that it can provide in your practice? And we'll close out this poll here. And great, so everyone is interested and sees a relevant benefit, particularly in the rapid diagnosis, which I think uh, we're going to show you the yield on. And we can't think of anyone better to bring us into the more know-how on how to do this procedure than Dr. Camilla Edwards, who we're so happy to have back. Dr. Camilla Edwards graduated from KVL in Denmark in 2006, and she's worked in general practice and emergency and critical care in the UK. She achieved her certificate in advanced veterinary practice in 2018 and started her company First Opinion Veterinary Ultrasound in 2018, where she scans for general practice in the UK, reviews ultrasound machines, teaches ultrasound, and runs a Facebook community with over 2,000 vets interested in ultrasound, many of whom I'm sure are here today in the audience. Thanks so much, Camilla. It's good to have you back. It's great to be back, Oren. Thank, thanks for that introduction. 
Um, so tonight we're going to talk about um, fine needle aspiration, um, which is a technique that I use um, really often in practice. So I'm really excited to talk about this. Um, just to uh, declare my conflict of interest, I'm receiving an honorarium for this webinar. OK, so what are we going to learn in this webinar? We're going to look at the indications, so when to perform a fine needle aspirate, um, look at potential complications and how to uh, pre prevent them from happening. Uh, we'll look at how to prepare our patients um, and what 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 instruments we need to have ready as well, and then how to take the fine needle aspirate and how to practice taking fine needle aspirates. And we'll also look at a little bit closer at that um, great article that Oren highlighted, which um, also goes into depth on which organs are great to, to take samples from. And finally, we'll look at some cases. So we are assuming a bit of knowledge already to do with ultrasound um, this evening, because um, this does require that we have some um, basic anatomy knowledge and that we are able to spot pathology as well with the ultrasound machine. So let's start with indications. So we will be using this fine needle aspirate technique, um, which is ultrasound guided, when we find um, a lesion that we want to get cells for to get a pathologist to interpret what, what the definitive diagnosis is. If we see free fluid, we can uh, take a sample of that and again have it analysed. Um, fluid from an organ lumen, so we're thinking um, possibly from a bladder or a gallbladder, for example, um, and sampling as part of a treatment. So we can drain abscesses or we can relieve pleural effusions while we're getting a sample that we can use to um, send off for, for culture and sensitivity, for example. But we need to talk about possible complications. Um, the complications are, are pretty rare. Um, having done lots of fine needle aspirates myself, um, it's very, very rare that I've had complications, but we do have to be aware of them so that we can minimize the risks. So bruising and hemorrhage are, are potential complications. Fluid leakage, uh, in particular thinking about urine and, and bile, if we're um, trying to get samples from the urinary bladder or the gallbladder. Uh, we're thinking about organ rupture, so rupture of, again, the, the um, urinary bladder and gallbladder, and also tracking of neoplastic cells. But we do need to remember that risks are low. Okay, so how can we manage these risks? How can we minimize the, the risks of these things happening? So when it comes to hemorrhage and bleeding, we have the potential to take coagulation tests. This isn't always necessary. We're using fairly small needles, um, small needle bores. So we don't, uh, you know, if we're potentially thinking about, we would take a sample from a jugular vein with the same size needle, then that's not gonna be any more risky uh, taking a sample uh, in the liver or, or spleen. Um, but if we are worried about coagulation, then we should definitely perform coagulation tests. Um, we need to choose our route wisely. So use that color Doppler if you have it available on your machine so that we avoid any large blood vessels. We don't wanna hit them if we don't need to. And we need to take the shortest route to the lesion that minimizes the risk of hitting something else important as well. To avoid um, fluid leakage and organ rupture, we really, really need to consider whether an organ is structurally, structurally um, capable of coping with a needle going through it. So. Um, if, if we have a, uh, a severely altered gallbladder wall, then we may need to reconsider whether we're gonna stick a needle into that. Um, but if we do want to go through a fairly normal looking gallbladder wall, then to get a bile sample, um, I'd advise going through the liver so that the liver can form a seal over the gallbladder um, to prevent any leakage. That's really the only example of where we would pass through another organ of, of interest. Otherwise we want to go to, uh, directly to the organ. The other um, risk is neoplastic seeding. And we most commonly see this with carcinoma um, and in particular transitional cell carcinoma in the bladder and prostate. Um, so we, 
we have seen cases of this, but the risk is, is low. So we don't want to um, completely avoid it if that's our, our final resort. Um, but we can try other methods of getting cells, such as traumatic catheterization first. And in these cases, we really only want to pass through the organ of interest. We don't want to seed any cells in other organs. So which organs can we take fine needle aspirates from? Um, this uh, paper that, that Oren talk, talked about as well is a really good summary um, of, of the pros and cons of, of taking fine needle aspirates from, from each organ. But in summary, we really um, can take samples from a lot of different abdominal organs and get good results. So from the bladder, we can do cystocentesis. Um, ultrasound guided is definitely safer than doing blind cystocentesis, which is something that um, we have done in the past. So we can improve our technique there by using ultrasound. Um, if we see a tumor in the bladder, we can take FNA. It is very reliable diagnostically, but we do have that small risk of seeding. So I always try and take a tra traumatic catheterization first, if possible. With the prostate, um, you can potentially drain prostatic abscesses. Um, and, but again, with fine needle aspirates, we do have to be uh, wary of neoplastic seeding. The liver uh, is something that people often worry about sticking a needle in the liver, but complications are fairly rare. Um, but diagnostically, we do have to prepare our clients that we might not always get the result that we um, are, are after. Sometimes we do, and it's really useful and we can move forward, but we do have to be aware that occasionally with fine needle aspirates, because we're only collecting a few cells, then um, we, we may not get the definitive diagnosis. Spleen, again, um, diffuse disease such as lymphoma is really useful for di diagnostically. Um, focal lesions often get diluted with blood, um, not so useful. Gallbladder sampling is um, some, sometimes thought to be a bit controversial because the risks, if something does go wrong and you get a bile peritonitis, is, is a pretty huge one. So you do really need to weigh up whether you want to take a sample or not. The kidney has a greater risk of bleeding than the liver, but achieves really good diagnostic results and complications are rare. The gastrointestinal tract is one that we're a little bit cautious of doing because we don't want to hit that lumen. But if the if there's a wall tumor, um, then it's, it's definitely worth sticking a, a needle in if it's thick enough and you feel that you can achieve a sample from, from that thickness of, of wall. And abdominal lymph nodes is also uh, a really useful organ to sample to um, look for metastatic spread or lymphoma. So when we're preparing our patient, we need to consider sedation or general anesthetic. We really need our patients to be still. Often sedation is, is enough. It's not incredibly painful. Um, you know, we're, we're sticking a small needle through the skin and muscle wall and into the organ of interest. So it's not particularly painful. So sedation is often enough to keep the animal still. We should cl uh, clip the patient's hair so that we can prepare a sterile area. And really key is that we should remove ultrasound gel from the skin um, and the probe as it can mimic necrotic tissue um, and pathologists really don't like it when we send cells with um, ultrasound gel on them. So the area should be cleaned and prepared with alcohol. This um, facilitates ultrasound so we can actually see um, because we're not using gel. So we really need that connection between the ultrasound probe and the patient to be good. And alcohol does really help with that, but it's also sterile and um, can help to sterilize the area. Samples should be placed in tubes and on slides as necessary if we're getting free fluid or if we're getting um, cells for cytology. And needle size is something that um, I often get asked about. Um, and it will depend on the site and the patient and the vet. But we're normally talking about blue or green needles. So your 23 or 21 gauge needles um, and usually one and a half inch. So longer than you're usually using in practice for other things um, is, is usually a good length. But we'll talk about how to figure out what length we'll need a little bit later on. So we use the same syringe for the same sampling site, but a new needle 
each each time. Um, and when we change the site, um, we we use a new syringe, and um, it's it's important to get lots of samples from each site. The more samples we have, the more likely we'll get a diagnosis. And then you need to prepare slides and containers as necessary. So we don't want to go straight in with a needle into an animal. We really want to practice first. And I know Shelley's going to show us a demonstration on how to practice a little bit later on. But here are a few things that you can try um, at home. So you can use a simulator um, like I will demonstrate shortly, um, like we've got here in the middle. Um, we can you can make your own jelly or jello mold, as uh, I think you say in Canada and, and America. <laughs> um, with that, you can um, place olives inside the inside the jelly. Um, and that's a great thing to use as a target instead of a lesion. And you can use um, things like tofu or meat. OK, so how to take the sample? We really want to take the shortest route to the lesion. Um, and that might involve moving the animal from um, the, the position that we'd normally scan that organ into a completely different position. So um, as you might know from previous webinars, I like to scan in lateral recumbency. But when I'm taking samples, I may well have the animal in dorsal recumbency or slightly oblique recumbency, just whatever position enables me to get to the lesion on the shortest route. The thing I like to do is um, to, to decide my needle length is to measure from the corner that I'm, I'm taking, the, um, the, going to be sticking the needle in and down to the lesion. And this helps me decide what uh, length needle I, I need to reach that, that lesion comfortably. I want to be avoiding um, blood flow and intestines in the area. So I need to think in 3D and fan through the area. So I don't just look at this two dimensional image, I fan through to try and understand what's going on all around the area where I want to stick a needle through. So here's a little video on how to um, practice with a simulator. So we've got the probe on the simulator here and inside it, there's this fake olive. Um, and here I'm going to stick the, the needle. Um, this is a much larger needle than I'd normally use. Um, I'm going to come in from this top left corner here. And I can already see the needle coming in just here. Um, we need to work out what angle we need to come in at um, to, to hit that, that lesion. Um, so that's really important. As we're following the needle down, um, we want to be able to view it the whole time. And once it gets down to the, the lesion, I do a little woodpecker technique, just moving the needle forwards and backwards um, a few times before I take out the needle again. Also, you may have been able to see that I had a little bit of air already in the syringe, so that when I've removed um, the, the needle from the patient, I'm able to immediately squirt that sample out onto a slide and make a squash preparation. So you push the air out and it pushes the material out of the needle onto the slide and then you exactly. can reload it for the next woodpecker. Uh, exactly, next woodpecker. exactly. Because you were talking about a really tiny sample within that needle hub. So you don't want to be removing um, the syringe to get air to, um, to then push that through after you've all, already got the sample because then you may lose it um, because they're really, really small samples we're talking about. So once we've, um, pushed out that um, sample onto the slide, we can take another slide at 90 degrees to the first, squash the sample and then push the top slide away from you. Um, and that, that gives a nice thin layering of cells for the pathologist to look at. Key thing is that the more samples that you take from each lesion, the more likely a diagnosis is achieved. So take as many samples as, as, you, as you can. I usually attempt to get about four or five from each lesion. Um, occasionally it's a small area and difficult to get to and I might only manage fewer. Um, but yeah, if I can, I'm aiming for four or five. After the procedure, it's, it's really key to 
um, take a, a, another image of the area from where you've sampled just to check whether there's any free fluid. So whether you're scanning the bladder and you're looking for any leaking from the bladder or if you're worried about any bleeding. So trying to get a, a view immediately after you've taken the samples. And then again, um, a few minutes or a few hours later is al always good to just check on that patient. If you have any free fluid, um, then the thing to do is to measure it. Um, and then you can go back shortly after um, to see whether, whether the fluid is increasing or whether it's stops bleeding a clot has formed and and everything's okay which is by far usually the case okay so now we're going to talk about a few cases so we've got um, our first case is a 19 year old female neutered domestic shorthead cat who had a history of going off food and weight loss so here we have the abdomen and we can see lots of loops of intestine. Um, and, and then we've got this jejunal lymph node coming into view here as well. The loops of intestine are, are slightly in, abnormal in that the muscularis layer is, is slightly thicker than normally than I would expect. So on this still image, we can see there's the jejunal lymph node. Uh, which was just much more prominent um, the, than I would expect. Um, and then we've got the, the muscularis layer in the intestine, which is this layer on this longitudinal piece of intestine, which was also just slightly thicker than I'd, I'd expect. So again, just looking at this lesion, we've got in this image, we've got the spleen up here, we've got some intestine here, and then we've got this jejunal lymph nodes and some small intestine with the, the thicker muscularis layer. And Camilla, that bright line, the hyperechoic line, that's the back of the cat. So you're saying that the cat's yeah. body cavity is three centimeters deep? <laughs> Abs absolutely. This was a really skinny old cat. So wow. yeah really 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 skinny um in this uh, mid to caudal part of the abdomen that, that i was scanning so um very very skinny not no fat on it whatsoever so here here again we've got um these these loops of intestine just slightly thicker than normal muscularis layers thicker than normal and we're scanning all the way back to the bladder here so um, our findings in this case were that um, we had a thickened muscularis layer throughout the jejunum and we had an enlarged hypoechoic jejunal lymph node. So our aim was to find the shortest route um, to the lymph node. The, the, the intestine would, be, would have been lovely to sample as well, but um, it wasn't quite thick enough to, to guarantee that we wouldn't hit the, the lumen. So we were really focused on trying to get a good sample from the jejunal lymph nodes and see what, what that could tell us. Um, so we really need to assess the sur surrounding organs, assess the local vasculature, and then check the area post FNA. So here we've managed to get the jejunal lymph node really close to the surface of the animal. So I'm really only gonna go through skin, um, abdominal muscle, and then straight into this lymph node. And that's the best way. So you're not going through any other organs and you're not going through even mesentery, deep mesentery. We've found, found a position that we can get directly to the jejunal lymph node. And then we measure to figure out what needle length we need. And we can see up here, um, the needle length, so, so just over a centimetre. So when I was talking about before that often we might need a, an, an inch and a half, that, that would be far too big for this um, sample. So not necessary in this case, we can use a much shorter needle. So here we've, we've got this, these loops of intestine with uh, very uh, slightly thickened muscularis lay wall layering. And here we're starting to take the needle sample. So you can see the needle entering the jejunal lymph node um, using woodpecker technique um, just to try and get some cell samples from in there. 
And it's then, worth highlighting, oh. you know, what resolution you have, like that you're basically in a centimeter deep uh, watching your needle kind of go at the, it, it, it's easy to get misled on this big screen, like it's this big target, but you're really targeting this small structure. It's just blowing up really? uh, in such magnification, right? Yeah, well, like it says down here, we're we're looking <laughs> two point four centimeters in. Um, yeah. So this is really happening in the top centimeter. This needle, so it's fantastic that we can see such detail. Um, absolutely. And then, as I said before, it's really key to get lots of samples. So um, trying to follow that needle again into the jejunal lymph node to get another sample. Um, it's really, really key. Um, okay. And then we want to know, we want to check the area afterwards to check that we've not caused any bleeding. Um, even if we have caused bleeding, that's not always a reason to panic. These things often clot quite quickly after um, it, a, a very small bleed, but it is absolutely something that we need to keep a close eye on. So fanning through the area where we took a sample from is really key post fine needle aspirate. So what we found in this case was um, with the fine needle aspirate of the lymph node that we had mild hyperplasia, which um, is what we were expecting in this case that we either had an enteritis or a, um, or a, a inflammatory bowel um, disease. So we um, were ruling out neoplasia in this case, um, but potentially um, would need to, to follow that up with, with further tests. But with an older cat, they weren't willing to go through surgery and, and biopsies anyway. So um, it was a case of, of medical management from this point forward. Okay, so our second case was a male neutered 11 year old domestic shorthead cat who'd recently had pancreatitis. Um, but what we found on um, abdominal examination, um, fo following this bout of pancreatitis, he'd just not quite been, been himself. So we wanted to, to scan the abdomen to see whether there was still a, a grumbling pancreatitis or whether there was anything else going on. Well, what we found was this area um, in the small intestine um, where there was a very focal area of a thickened um, intestinal wall. So on a still image here, just to demonstrate. So with this longitudinal um, part, piece of intestine, we had um, quite a, a thin wall here um, from the lumen in the center and then through the mucosa, submucosa muscularis out to the serosal layer. But on this section from the lumen out through the wall was much, much longer and the wall layering was not clear in that area. And it, it linked up with this mass as well. So we could follow that um, wall thickening in the intestine and follow that to this um, even bigger mass um, that was associated with it. So we've got the thickened wall layering here, and then we have the mass here. So this really quite quite a large mass um, associated with the intestines. Definitely, we wanted to investigate and figure out um, what that potentially was um, and whether there was potential for surgical resection because it was a, a focal area. So our findings were that we had a this focal mass associated with the, the jejunum and this focal area of, of increased wall thickness. So again, our aim was to find the shortest route to sample this, avoiding small intestine, avoiding blood vessels, and remembering to check post fine needle aspirate. So we want to check all around the area. What are we finding um, around the area? We want to put color Doppler on to check how vascular the, the mass is itself um, and whether there are any large vessels nearby that we need to avoid with our needle. So that 
not a very vascular mass. Um, so that didn't concern me um, at all with, with putting a needle in that area. Okay, so again, trying to measure, um, and we can see that to get to the, the bottom of this lesion was, was a bit deeper than, than the previous lesion. Um, and so we want to, to measure, uh, but a, an inch and a half would be, would be plenty to get to the, the lesion itself in this case. So here the, the needles entering through the skin and the abdominal wall. Um, and down to the mass. And here you can really appreciate the mass as well um, as the needle moves the whole, whole mass there. And um, we use the woodpecker technique to get samples, withdraw the needle and, and put that onto a slide, that sample. Again, putting the needle into the, into the lesion, taking woodpecker. We can really see the mass moving there. It's all bouncing. <laughs> it's bouncing, yeah. We've, we, often leave a few, uh, a little bit of gas in there, that's inevitable, um, but that can really highlight where the needle has been as well. So that can be quite useful when you're looking for the area an hour later, um, um, there, there can potentially, or a quarter of an hour later, there potentially could be a few, a few gas bubbles left, which can help uh, remind you exactly where your needle tract went. Okay, so, Cytology in this case revealed a mast cell tumour, and this is the third most common intestinal neoplasm in cats after lymphoma and carcinoma. Um, and metastases are common to local draining lymph nodes and liver, but having done an abdominal ultrasound, we, we didn't find any other lesions that we were worried about. So we felt happy that it was contained to this area and, and potentially that surgery could be um, curative if we managed to get all of all of it out. Okay, so what are the take home messages today? We want to think about patient preparation. Don't forget to wipe away all the ultrasound gel. Your pathologist will not be happy if you get a cell sample with ultrasound gel in it. Um, you want to practice taking samples. So practice in simulate, simulators initially, and that might be a simulator or jelly or um, meat or tofu or whatever you can, can try with. Um, you just want to get used to following that needle in towards a lesion. So following it a few centimeters down in, and it's really lining up and getting that, that lined up so that you can do that repetitively. Then using um, cystocentesis as, a, as the next step up. So doing ultrasound guided centesis, cystocentesis, and then attempting to FNA organs. The spleen is often a good one to start with because it's very superficial organ um, and, and easy, to, easy to hit the right place. And then you want to practice that woodpecker technique as well to try and get those, those cells. With your slide preparation, I like to use a squash, squash technique, but that you can use um, a blood smear technique as well. Um, it's totally up, up to you how, how you get that um, thin layer of cells onto that slide. We must look after our patients post-sampling. So scanning immediately to look for any free fluid immediately after the sample's taken, and then scanning 30 minutes or so later to check that there's no free fluid in the area. If there is free fluid, then don't panic, measure it, and then have a look a little bit later on to see whether it's getting worse or whether it's resolved itself. So the key, as always, is to practice, practice, practice. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, wanted to tell you about a free gift that I have for you. If you visit www.fovu.co.uk forward slash Clarius, um, there is an ebook waiting for you and my review of the Clarius C7V HD3. And if you have any questions about ultrasound guided fine needle aspirates or anything else to do with ultrasound, don't hesitate to send me an email at camilla at fovu.co.uk.
just wanted to tell you about a few up and coming courses we have in FOVU. We have got the basics starting on the 20th of February next year. It's a four weeks online pre-recorded webinars um, with a active discussion board um, where you can post cases and discuss. Um, and the trickier bits uh, where we discuss fine needle aspiration techniques as well starts on the 31st of October of this year. As always, my nurse and text course is six weeks online and runs all year long. So you can just find any of those courses at www.fovu.co.uk forward slash ultrasound hyphen courses. Great, thanks so much, Camilla, for excellent presentation as always. Uh, a reminder to everyone that this session is race approved and uh, to stay tuned for the entire hour to get your educational credit. Uh, to, to sum up, I think some of the content that you covered, Camilla, um, five ways that ultrasound guided FNA can help your practice. Uh, I think you showed cases where you could avoid an X-LAP and uh, avoid surgery, right? None of those needed to go to surgery, those cases. Um, I like how you show the preventing complications, guiding the needle with ultrasound, and uh, was general anesthesia required in either of those cases that you showed us? No, um, they were both done under sedation, so yeah, really Great. no need for anesthesia there. Quicker, less resource intensive, that's great. And, and then I guess your clinical answer probably comes much faster if you can do it. You book in someone for the, you know, an office procedure, it's much simpler than booking them for general anesthesia and surgery. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if we were going to do an exploratory laparotomy on these cases, we would definitely need to um, make sure the team was available and the anesthetic machine was free. We would need to book them in for a time, whereas this could be done, um, you know, um, in a much smaller room, um, as long as we can fit the ultrasound machine in and the animal and, and me, and then then that's fine. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And then uh, again, th no need to refer the clients out, the patients out for for um, extra testing. We've heard in other webinars, sometimes if that happens, you have to refer someone out, you never see them again. So uh, it keeps your patients in your practice. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, and I see a lot of questions in the Q&A. So please stay tuned. A lot of those questions we're going to get to and answer. Uh, first, we're going to hand it over to Shelly Gunther, our clinical manager, to do a quick demonstration on how to master the skill of fine needle aspiration. <laughs> thanks so much, Aron, um, and thanks, Camilla. Great presentation. Um, I'm going to just uh, give a little live demo, not a live, live demo, but I have a chicken breast here that I've uh, put some olives into, and uh, we're going to find them. Um, and then we're going to, I'm going to show you uh, kind of the technique for the, the FNA and uh, just the tips that uh, that Camilla went over. So give me a second here and I'm going to just switch over my camera. And I think it's um it's a good idea, you know, just in general of learning the hand-eye coordination. It's one thing to learn diagnostics of ultrasound, it's one hand, and now we have to kind of coordinate both hands and the real thin plane of the ultrasound beam, keeping your needle in view. It takes a bit of practice to really feel confident uh, seeing that whole needle, maintaining it in view, and really being confident about where your, where your needle tip is, I guess, of all things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and that that just requires practice. So that's why um, cystocentesis is good because we'd often be doing that blind anyway, so ultrasound makes that safer. Um, but also, yeah, like this on, on a bit of chicken breast or um, in jelly. Or tofu, okay. if that's more your style. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, Camilla and I had a conversation um, the other day just about, about you know, what I was going to use for this. And she had mentioned that sometimes getting, eliminating the air after you insert the olive into the uh, chicken breast is, can be a little bit of a challenge. But um I, I made sure that I uh, just made a, a small little kind of incision in the bottom of the chicken breast and popped the, the olive in there and then really kind of compressed it and, and wrapped it in uh, in plastic wrap really tightly uh, to make sure that there's no air in there. And I, I think it worked pretty well from what, from what we were seeing. So, Thanks. all right, so we've, um, you know, our patient has presented, we know has a mass. And so we need <laughs> to kind of locate that mass here and I can see one right here. And so um, my olives, I, I didn't have ones with pimento in them. I had ones with pits in them. So there's a really deep 
dark shadow here from the olive pit, but you can see a little bit of a, a slightly more echogenic mass, we'll call it right here. And so I'm going to come in um, from, from this side. And uh, so Camilla, like you had mentioned, I guess we can, we can do a uh, little measurement to see how far our trajectory is going to be. And we're about uh, uh, well under two centimeters. So I think I have an inch and a half uh, needle and uh, so I'm just going to grab that. Now, um, if I was coming in from the other side, that would be uh, where our indicator is, the green light, which corresponds to the, um, the Clarius logo up here. But I'm in this uh, plane here, so I'm going to, I'm going to find my mask again. Yeah. I like it's using the really olive important. Pit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really important to know which side you're going to come in from. That, that's really key. I've seen sometimes where, where students have been surprised by which side it's showing on the screen. So that yeah. is really key to figure that out first. I, I like for practice, I was going to say the, the olive pit is a great idea because it gives you a target and a backstop. Right? You, <laughs> you like advance to the, to the pit and you know you've really hit this tiny little target. Uh, so at this point, I would just go back and forth. If I hit the tip, I can feel that, or <laughs> the pit, I can feel it. Mm -hmm. So I'll just do my woodpecker approach here. Nice. Great. And then, and we're done. And I can actually see some some tissue in the in the hub of the needle. I should have had some air <laughs> in there, but uh, some olive tissue. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So yeah, I mean, great way to practice. Um, I highly recommend it. It's easy. Uh, you may want to use something that's a little less expensive than meat these days, but there's like, as uh, Camilla said, there's lots of different options um, for you to, to practice these things. And it really does give you uh, a really good feel for, you know, how to do it, what, what, what's going to work best for you. That was great, Shelley. Okay, Thanks. excellent. Uh, there's a lot of great questions and we're going to have um, ample time to dive in and get to as many of those as we can. Um, before we get there, we're going to hand it back to Junez here for a moment. Please use the Q&A and make sure to keep populating it and we're going to get to all of these questions shortly. Thank you, Dr. Frankel, and thank you, Shelley, for the live demo, and thank you, Dr. Edwards, for all your best practices that you shared with us today. I do encourage everyone to stay on for the full webinar to qualify for one CECPD credit, which you'll receive by email from the Vet Show in the coming days. I believe you have to participate for a minimum of 50 minutes. Um, so before we begin our live Q&A, we do have a question for you. This poll is an opportunity to learn more about our third generation Claris wireless ultrasound scanners for veterinary medicine. Please uh, complete this poll to let us know if we can provide further information and do click on as many options as you wish. Pricing and availability does vary by region, so please do request a quote for pricing in your region. You may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with one of our clinical experts to see the new Claris AG3 in action in a highly interactive session uh, where you can ask questions. Um, and you can send, uh, we can send you more video tutorials on veterinary ultrasound so that you can continue on your learning journey. Um, so while you go ahead and select as many options as you wish, I will take a minute to tell you a bit about our Claris HD3 VET scanners for the highest definition wireless ultrasound imaging to speed diagnosis for small, medium, and large animals. Our C7 HD3 microconvex VET scanner, which you saw in action today, is specifically designed for clear clinical imaging for small and medium animals like cats and dogs. We also have the C3 convex VET for larger animals like sheep and horses, and the L7 linear VET for superior animal MSK imaging, often used for equine applications. Now 30% smaller and lighter, more affordable and with an enclosed battery, our third generation family of VET scanners deliver several advantages. Claris HD3 is unrivaled for high resolution imaging and handheld ultrasound with dedicated animal presets. Claris shows you the fine detail you need to investigate an area of concern, perform a fast exam, guide an aspiration, and make a confident diagnosis on your patient's first visit to expedite the right treatment plan. Each scanner is designed with eight 
uh, bean formers, not one or two, but eight bean formers, 192 elements that deliver the image quality and speed only found in traditional systems, but at a fraction of the cost that represents 60 to 90% savings over compact systems. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons, making our scanners fast and easy to learn and use. Claris is also wireless with zero footprint for high portability to scan animals anywhere they are from the vet clinic to their homes. You get free movement with no more wires getting in the way or startling the animals, also making it so much faster to clean and disinfect. Only Clarius delivers wireless scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS or Android devices with free updates. Available with our new membership offering, Clarius Cloud allows you to capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership includes in-app Clarius classroom videos with experts like Dr. Edwards and onboarding with Clarius clinicians to build your ultrasound scanning skills. And Clarius Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. Also available with your membership, the new Advanced Veterinary Package offers more flexibility for users who want advanced workflows for various animal exams, for example, with access to finely tuned presets categorized by application and anatomy. For clinicians who prefer a one-time purchase over a membership, the Advanced Veterinary Package is available as an add-on purchase. With increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Claris HD VET scanner, which is ultra affordable. We'll now take three seconds to close out the poll to allow you to request more information. Two, one. Thank you for participating. We will get back to you in the coming week. We do have one final poll prior to our Q&A session. We'd like to invite you to pre-register for our next veterinary webinar. Please click yes to save your seat for our Wednesday, December 12th webinar entitled Veterinary Focus, Understanding and Diagnosing Lung Consolidation. It's easier than you think. Internist Dr. Soren Boysen and criticalist Dr. Serge Shaloub will teach corneal care ultrasound techniques to diagnose lung consolidation in under five minutes at the cage side in their banter filled and dynamic educational session. I'll give you five more seconds to save your seat. Four, three, two, one. Okay, let's now begin our live QA session. We have dozens and dozens of questions. Please do use the Q&A icon in the menu bar to ask your questions for Dr. Edwards. Because this is a common question and I see many have asked it already, I do wanna let everyone know that in the coming days, we'll send you an email with a recording for today's webinar as well as a copy of the presentation. And from the vet show, if you attended for 50 minutes or more, you will receive a link to redeem your CECPD credit. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Frankel to moderate our Q&A session. Um, with Dr. Camilla Edwards. Camilla, there are so many questions. Uh, let's try and go rapid fire and we'll okay. do what we can to get through as many <laughs> as we can. Okay, yep. um, and I'll try and group them together. So the first one, everyone wants to know, you have air in the syringe, you're needling in, are you aspirating when you're going or do you just woodpecker and then mm -hmm. pop out the sample? Yeah, so I use just the woodpecker technique. It's really hard when you've got your, the probe in one hand, needle and syringe in the other hand to aspirate um, and um, keep that needle in view the whole time. So no, I use a woodpecker technique. So I'm just moving that needle back and forwards. Um, and most by far, most of the time, that's enough to get good um, cell samples. If I've tried that a couple of times in a lesion and I'm just not getting anything, then I will apply a bit of negative pressure to try and get a few cells in. Um, but it's 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 really not very much pressure at all because the, the worry is then when you're pulling out of the animal is that you'll suck, suck it all into the syringe. So um, you do have to do that very carefully and, and gently, but it's by far not, not most of the time, I'm just using the wood, woodpecker technique. Great. Uh, next question is probably the second most common we have here uh, today is what sedation do you like to use for your yes. FNA profile? So, um, it's, that's a really popular question. Um, it's a really difficult one to answer as well because um, different countries, you'll have different drugs available to you. Um, so it, in that way, it's difficult. It's also what is usual in your practice to use. Um, so using drugs that you are used to, there'll be less mistakes made. Um, it's safer. Um, 
And also all, each of these patients are individual and will have varying different conditions that are going on at the same time. So um, you really need to adapt your sedation pro protocol to the condition of the animal. Um, so it's a really difficult one to answer. There's no specific, um, this is my sedation protocol that I use in all cases um, to sedate for FNA. Um, it is a case of, I need this animal to stay still it's got such and such conditions what is most appropriate in this case so there's no there's no golden answer to that i'm afraid um mm. it is yeah adapt to your patient nice um a lot of folks want to know how can they figure out you know pathology like how do maybe the way i could interpret these questions is how can uh practitioners become comfortable identifying something that's pathologic that then they need to biopsy yeah, so um, doing a systematic exam on all of your patients, rather than going directly to the organ that you're worried about all the time, doing that full systematic review of the abdomen is key because um, then you will um, you'll get better and better adapted to seeing what normal is. And that is when you are able to start spotting what abnormal is. So you kind of need to know what normal is, have seen that lots and lots then pathology will start standing out to you um, and, and becoming much more obvious. So that's that's really the key is practicing um, on lots of patients. And I think uh, you mentioned this before, but just um, we had talked in the pre-webinar about how important it is to keep your pathologist happy. Uh, yeah. So maybe the way this question is formed is, um, you know, how many times do you have to poke each woodpecker? And then how many samples do you take? If you could just review that briefly. Yeah, so doing the woodpecker, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know how many times I, I, I move. <laughs> <You peck. laughs> I've never counted. Um, yeah, just, um, it, I guess it also depends on the feel because you get a feel of, of, of the lesion that you're, that you're going into as well, whether that feels very soft or firm or mineralized or, um, so yeah, you, you get a feel of just doing a few times back and forth. Um, and then seeing seeing what you get from that. Um, so I yeah. So if on your first go you've gone back four or five times, and then you've got a massive sample, and it takes up the whole slide, then perhaps do less on the next one, um, and likewise do more if you're not getting very much. Um, and yeah, I try to get four or five samples from each lesion um, because that keeps my pathologist happy. Um, as you said, um, it, it really gives them the best chance of, of making that diagnosis. Um, they get plenty of cells um, from, from different angles um, that they can, they can then look at. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people want to know if you ever do the uh, biopsy or aspiration without the syringe, like just a needle uh, to maybe drive it a little better and then attach the syringe afterward. Yeah, I I guess that would be per personal preference. Um, there's there's no right or wrong with that. I, I don't think that I, I do it with the syringe, then it's all set up for me afterwards um, to, to spray that sample onto a slide. And I guess I'm used to that weight of that syringe now. So that that feels normal to me. It would feel quite odd to me to not have that weight of the syringe. So if you're used to doing it with just a needle, that would be perfectly acceptable too. Uh, okay, I'm gonna try and consolidate these questions. Uh, folks wanna know, um, I guess, you know, why do you enter right to the side of the probe? And if you ever go out of plane, uh meaning sort yeah. of crossing with your ultrasound probe um to, to yeah. get your sample so i never do that um um we were we talked about that earlier as well so i i want to be able to see the whole path that my needle is taking um and if i go from um the flat side of the probe i can't see um there's a good centimeter or, or so where i don't know what that needle is passing through um, so I, I really always go with the, with the plane. Yes, it's too, two dimensional and you you really have to get it accurate. Um, but then when you have got it accurate, you know exactly what organs it's passing through and, and where it's heading towards as well. So you can adjust the angle if you need to as well. So, um, no, I, I would never go in a different plane to that. Thanks. 
do you use true cut biopsy? Uh, yes, so that that's uh, a little bit more advanced um, because the risks are a bit higher. Um, so there are risks with bleeding um, and you really want to make sure that your coagulation status is, is um, ensured. And also um, you really want to avoid, avoid uh, um, biopsy with, um, with livers in cats. That's been shown to, it can cause shock and death. Um, it's just such a, a brutal procedure in, in a cat that um, there's been quite a few cases where, where they have suddenly died after the procedure. Yeah. So um, it's not some, it's not the same as a fine needle aspirate, but you do need to have that skill of following the biopsy needle. So it's um, definitely worth getting good at fine needle aspirates first and then working your way up to doing true cut biopsies. And they are good because they, they're more likely to get diagnosis um, because you're grabbing more cells um, so so that's definitely a, a pro for them but you do need to to be expert at following that needle a couple of our participants um, have been doing fnas but have hit some trouble so okay. uh, one was talking about a spleen fna they did that was inconclusive with only a lot of red blood cells one talking about um, trying to do a cystocentesis, it sounds like, but not aspirating urine, even though uh, they saw urine in the bladder and maybe their needle too. Do you have any suggestions on uh, improved technique for folks? Yeah, so a common thing with the, um, if we talk about the cystocentesis first, is um, that you, you haven't got a needle that's long enough. Um, it really needs to be long enough so that um, it does pierce through the bladder wall. If it's only just long enough, it will have a tendency to push the bladder wall and just indent it instead. And then you don't, you don't get, get you haven't got the power behind um, to push through the bladder wall. So then, then when you're drawing back, although it might even look like you're in the bladder because the bladder wall sort of folds in on the needle, uh, you're not actually in, in the bladder. So that, that's probably what happened in that case. Um, with the spleen, um, yes, um, you can struggle sometimes to get samples um, that haven't got blood in them. Um, it's, uh, this is particularly a problem if you've got a, a focal lesion. If you've got a diffuse uh, splenic disease, it, fine needle aspirates is fantastic and often diagnostic. But if you're going for one small lesion in the spleen, blood is a problem. The main thing I can say is take lots of samples. Um, it's unlikely to cause a bleed that is uh, significant. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, but yeah, taking lots of samples. There again is that take home message, take lots yeah. of samples. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, I think um, we have time for maybe one last question. Uh, a lot of folks want to know, like, if you sterilize your probe, do you ever put a sterile sleeve over the probe? Is the alcohol enough? Uh, kind of variations yeah. on clean prep for the site. Yeah. So um, if we think about, um, yeah, it's it's really, uh, it, it's similar to um, taking a blood sample. So we are putting a needle inside um, a cavity. We do need to think about sterility. Um, but we should, the needle should never be touching the probe, um, that, that you're too close to the probe if the needle is touching it. It should just go through the skin, through the, the muscle layer and into the lesion. Um, yeah, alcohol is, is, um, is plenty to um, avoid that air interruption um, between the probe and the patient. You can put the probe inside um, a glove and try and get connection. That way, it's not something I usually do um, because it ends up a bit clunky and you've always got um, um, a bit plastic or something in the way, a bit of glove in the way. Um, so it's much easier to go directly with the probe on the patient. But yes, uh, it is a concern. It's rubber on the probe and it's alcohol on the patient. Um, and alcohol does um, degrade rubber. So that's sort of a personal choice um, of how much you want to protect your probe versus how much you want to use it. Um, because I think if you have to go through a lot of fuss to use it, then it might not get used at all. And for that patient, 
it's more important to use it, I, I feel. Um, but giving your probe a wipe down afterwards um, can, can help to minimize the, the, the damage that alcohol might do to the probe. Great, thanks so much. Well, I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, Ginez, will you uh, close us out here? Absolutely. Uh, we've reached the top of the hour. It was a very dynamic Q&A. And if we didn't get to your question, we will follow up with you by email in the coming week. Again, you'll receive a copy of the slides and webinar recording as well. So do keep an eye out on your inbox and do keep an eye out for an email from the Vet Show for your uh, CECPD credit. I'd like to conclude by thanking Dr. Camilla Edwards for all of her teachings and best practices. A big thank you to Shelley and Dr. Frankel as well. And thank you all for joining us today. We do hope to see you again for our next veterinary POCUS webinar on December 12th. See you again. And in the meantime, keep scanning. Keep scanning. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.